DaVinci Resolve 18 is out. Here I want to have a detailed look what happened in Fusion. So I will show you some additions to the duplicate node, to the merge node. We got some additional apply nodes. We got a new custom polygon modifier. And from the color section, from the Resolve FX section, there is a new AI powered depth map tool and that works quite well in Fusion and I will spend some more time on that one to show you how to bring it into Fusion and make it compatible with other Fusion tools. There have been some bug fixes and performance enhancements, some of them quite important like the GPU acceleration of the paint tool. There have also been some upgrades to pipeline tools. I recommend you check out the detailed release notes on the uh, Blackmagic support site. So for example, we got new versions of OpenColorIO, of OpenEXR and extended Python support those more technical things have a look at the release notes here. I want to focus on the stuff that I can actually show and see. Let's have a look. Let me start with the easiest of them all with the duplicate node. You find the duplicate effect under effects and then here effect duplicate. And this is a 2D node. Um, so it takes an image and then duplicates it. If you have like full frame filling image that won't help. But if you have something with transparency, like some, some icons, graphics, text, stuff like this, uh, then you can use the duplicate node to make copies. So if you make zero copies, it's gone. And then you can make a number of copies and then uh, position them. And one copy to the next gets then like an, an offset like this uh, or a scale factor, etc. cetera. Um, this has been there before. Also like a blend was there before if you want to fade something out. What is new is mostly this section. So you can uh, use a gain to make it like darker, brighter, change the color to stuff like this and also a blur. So you can blur things so that, for example, to make an effect where something vanishes into the distance, it's something you could do with a, a blur. So each copy gets a bit more blur. Um, so that's, that's quite nice. Uh, glow works in combination of blur. It is kind of a gain on the blurry part. So if it's a bit brighter, that won't really make much sense on the very dark image. But let's make this brighter again. And then you see that it starts uh, glowing a bit. Let me show you with a few um, with fewer copies. And you can just see here that the blurry part is getting well glowy as well. And if you want the glow to change color, you can uh, do this with the scale here and um, yeah, give it a different color. This is mostly about playing around and trying new things. Use some icons or something like this and uh, see what you come up with. Let me do one more try. Let me say I'll do 10 copies and I go only in the Jitter tab. So Jitter makes everything random and that also works with the gain and blur. But first let me make the offset random. So and the size. Um, yeah, like, like this. So I get some randomly distributed uh, larger and smaller options and the distribution is always um, this offset around the parameter that you are jittering. So you now get the original size and then plus minus 0.83 or maybe multiplied by 0.83 is a factor here I think and here it's a constant offset. So uh, if you put here 0 0.5, 0 0.5 then uh, the center position gets uh, from 0 0.5, 0 0.5 get jittered in this case by a constant offset here um, and it gets uh, like placed all over the frame, which you could fill the frame with if you make like a lot of um, copies. And if I make a lot of copies, you might notice that it takes a second to calculate. It's supposed to be accelerated, but it's still working on pixels. So if you feed in an HD image or 4K image or whatever, um, and it creates so and so many copies even uh, on the GPU, it might uh, take a little bit of time. And perhaps some color jitter as well. And if I set it to one, that means I have like the maximum um, color range to uh, jump around, vary around. This one's quite easy. You can play with it on your own. A bit more tricky are the updates to the merge node. And I'm at the moment a little bit conflicted to what extent I will actually use them or avoid using them. And I'll show you in a second why. Uh, let me take two media nodes. Um, let me take this one here. 
Uh, so I have this masked out and I have a background and I am merging over. Let me use two viewers so I can show side by side. So I put this ellipse image over the background so far. That's a normal merge, nothing new. Um, then if you go into the operators, uh, we always had these in and held out and the top operators and so on. These were always there. I have created a tutorial about the merge node and about all this kind of stuff. Uh, that tutorial was never very popular. I think not many people are very keen on, on this. Um, to be honest, very often if I need like complicated um, pasting something in, holding out, etc. Often I rather work with masks outside and make myself the masking logic clear rather than trying to do everything in the merge node. Uh, nonetheless, it's here and the additions that are here now are this mask and stencil and under option. And well, this allows you to use the foreground not as an image that you merge over, but use it as a mask. Um, so in this case, the image here uh, yeah, doesn't do anything except use the alpha channel and uses this to mask out the image before. Um, likewise, if you do stencil, it inverts the mask, so it cuts out a piece. Now, there are many different other ways to apply masks in Fusion. You can multiply a mask in most of the tools. You can use a matte control. Um, I'm not sure if I want to use it in a merge node because when I see the node graph, I look at it and I think, hey, there is some new element coming on top. Um, now the new element isn't really coming on top, but it's just acting as a mask. So I might rather use a matte control or a channel boolean or one of the existing ways to better see in the flow what I'm actually doing. I think the reason why they added this is that um, many people coming from layer-based software might be familiar with it or from the DaVinci Resolve edit page. If you do compositing in the edit page and you want to put a mask uh, over an image, uh, you can do that in layer-based editing and then you can do something like this, decide on how those are being combined via the edit uh, blend mode operation. So uh, that's, I guess, where this idea is coming from. Under is uh, basically putting the um, yeah, foreground under the background. So if I switch foreground and background, which you can do control T, um, then under is giving me the well, background under the foreground. So it's kind of switching these two inputs. It's not only switching them. The difference is that the transform controls here uh, still work on whatever is connected to the green input. So in this case, it's working to the on the background. So I can scale the background while it's being put under the foreground and reposition it. Now, of course, I can put a transform node before that. Um, so it's again a question, do I really want to do it? Because when I look at the node graph, it's kind of confusing because I'm used to yellow background, green foreground, and now it's the exact opposite. Um, it can be convenient that it's available in one tool. You don't need additional transforms. Or if you have different image dimensions, this arrow here, the yellow one, is still determining the final image dimension. Um, but yeah. So it's a kind of a shortcut to not have to transform outside if you need to transform the background or adjust the image dimension. These two are also new and they are more complex. Actually, you can, I have forgotten the exact definition from the manual. You can read it up. Uh, basically, they determine the calculation of semi-transparent pixels, how semi-transparent pixels are mixed when you have semi-transparent foreground and semi-transparent background. So if you have like masks with soft edges in the foreground and in the background, you combine them, uh, then there are different ways to uh, determine how to use those semi-transparent pixels. And well, that's that's what these two do. Finally, we have some change in the apply modes. First of all, they're organized by section. That is great because everything that basically makes the image darker is in one section and what makes it brighter is in one section and um, like different mixing operations in one section. Um, so that is nice. And they added an additional section with two new modes and those are uh, intended for HDR images when you have um, well, values above one, so outside of the regular zero one range, and uh, you want, well, uh, blend them in a slightly different way. So um, here it won't make too much difference because these are not HDR images. Nonetheless, let me show you. Um, so if I select geometric, you see even with blend one, I still get some transparency with the other one. Um, it will, yeah, so you get like different 
um, type of blend overlays and those are supposed to be quite good if you have really large out of range values and then you can uh, see what the result will look like. Let's head over to the custom polygon modifier. That's probably the most technical bit of this tutorial and I recommend it especially to those of you who are quite familiar with using polygons and motion path and that kind of stuff. I've done quite a few tutorials on this and I covered in my training courses. Um, but if you're relatively new to Fusion, this part might be a bit tricky. Um, nonetheless, you can always skip it like in Netflix, go to the next section if you don't like it. Uh, but for those of you who do like it, I have created two polygons here, two polygon shapes. Actually, let me um, put them together. I'm merging them together just by connecting just so that I see them on the left side. And now I want to manipulate um, those shapes. Uh, by the way, you can import them uh, also as SVG uh, vector graphics if you do import um, SVG. So you can import your uh, lovely vector graphics. Let me add another polygon and bring this into the right viewer and I can uh, draw something. Let's give it a border width. And this time I, I will just uh, use it as a line. Now this polygon here, uh, Polygons are by default animated, right? So there's a keyframe animation here, which I will remove. So I don't want to deal with animation, it's possible, um, but uh, I want to keep it a bit simpler to start with. But I can also connect other polygons to this polygon and then use certain mathematical functions to manipulate them. That's why I say it's a bit more technical. The way this works, I can do a right click and attach a custom poly modifier. And this will right away replace the uh, previously drawn uh, polygon. Um, and it gives me a modifier. And this modifier has most importantly this polyline section. And here it sends back a polygon. In this case, it sends back a straight line. A straight line with a certain number of points, especially 20 no points in this case. Uh, you can manipulate this line now with expressions. And the way these expressions work, you have for each point, uh, whatever formula is written here is being executed for each point and px and py are the variables of this point. So I could, for example, um, add here an offset point 0 0.1 and you see it's being shifted all points individually that have the x coordinates px get the point one added to px and they shift to the side. So that's how the logic of these expressions work. Um, you could also write, for example, like this. Now each coordinate from the straight line, the x coordinate is also put into the y coordinate, which gives a, a linear um, diagonal line in this case. So this is how you can uh, manipulate this. Um, but you don't have to start with a straight line. You can start with your own polygon by connecting a source polyline up here. For this, you need a polyline which is published. So in this case, let me go to the heart here, right click down here to publish the polyline, publish, which adds a, a modifier um, here, heart polyline value. Um, that's publishing the line of the polygon. I do the same for the arrow, right click, publish. Now these lines are published, meaning they're accessible in other tools and they're accessible in my polyline modifier here, or custom polygon modifier. And I can connect them here. I can right click, connect to, and connect the heart. And you see now what is happening is that my custom modifier, double click to go back, is using 20 points to move along the heart. So to follow this heart shape. Um, you still see a straight line here. That's because there are multiple lines that can be used here. So right now I have connected the source polygon and well, I can increase the number of points to get a better or worse heart. So you see it just goes along the polyline of the heart and um, yeah, it's a discretization. I can now manipulate my heart, for example, uh, give it an offset, you know, something like this, or I could uh, scale it. I can also use parameters that I have here. Uh, so here are some default parameters, a few numbers and the point parameter, and you can access them quite easily. For example, this number one here, let me set it to one to start with. Uh, this number one I can get 
just with the variable n1. And to learn what variables are there and what functions are there, you should really open the manual and have it on the side next to you because there are a few different functions and parameters and there's a complete list in the manual for the uh, custom tool, for the custom polygon modifier. Um, so now I'm, I'm scaling uh, these points. Let's see how that works. So I have now a control to scale and they yeah, scale all the points with a factor like this. Let's bring in the second one. So I right click here on the pulley line, connect to and connect the arrow like this back to the modifier. Uh, this is now connected and I can access that here. And let me delete this for a second. Uh, I can access this. Uh, the first one I can access with px and py. For the, the other ones I need to uh, access it with a get function. And so the function is called get x and then of a displacement. So let's let me put it in first to demonstrate that it's actually working and then we can discuss. So you see this way I have gotten the error. Uh, so this for any displacement, displacement is um, like the uh, position on the line for a polygon. So for any such displacement, I'm getting the x and the y coordinate of the related points along the displacement on the second polygon. So the displacement walks along the line of the polygon, walks around the polygon, and with uh, the get 2x, get 2y, I'm getting the uh, position as per the point displacement on the second polygon. And then for the third one, I could put a 3 here instead of 2. And I'm still uh, using the same 100 points, so also my arrow now uses the number of points that are up here and samples the polygon. Now I can combine the two. For example, I can add again my px. And you know what? I will uh, scale this like I have done before with n1 times px and plus n1 times py. And in front of this one, I'll do the opposite. I do 1 minus n1 times, and here 1 minus n1. So I'm scaling both of them, one with a number between 0 and 1, and the other exactly the opposite, so 1 minus 1. So uh, when this one is 0, this one is 1, and vice versa. And this way, I have now one slider, which if I move it from 0 to 1, transforms from an error to a Hard. And how this polygon looks like is all determined here as usual. So you can make it solid if you want or um, change the border width, etc. So this was one example transforming one polygon into another. Custom tool, of course, means there's no one particular uh, functionality that Blackmagic Design had in mind when developing it, but it's up to you to develop the formulas and to, to think about how you can use it. If you're familiar with the other custom tools, like the regular custom tool, custom vertex, custom force, uh, they work all quite similar. So um, if you're familiar with this, this might be an additional um, tool for your tool set. Now let's finish with probably the most exciting feature, which is the new depth map in DaVinci Resolve. It was advertised for color grading. It does work in Fusion. Let me show you right away. Let me work with it on this image and bring it in right away. Depth map. Here it is. And I'm connecting it and let me bring it on the left viewer and I see a depth map preview, which is just an RGB, well, grayscale image. Um, we don't really need that preview. If I turn it off, then you see that we get an alpha channel uh, and the RGB channel uh, stays intact. Uh, but if you switch to alpha channel A for alpha, you see the same image and you can use this right away um, to mask things. Now, what am I seeing in the alpha channel? Well, I see an image which goes from 1 to 0, um, 0 where the AI thinks is the background, 1 where it thinks is the closest bits, and then grayscale in between. And here you see it's doing a decent job. Um, it is, of course, a bit, you know, here a bit blurry, soft, and so on. You can try to tweak this, but all of these 
things that you do here are all uh, post-processing options on the grayscale image. Um, so basically this is what the AI determined and yeah, in, it will not necessarily work perfectly in all areas. It is an estimation, it's not a perfect solution, right? Um, keep that in mind. Now, how would I recommend to use it? Well, you can adjust it here. So for example, we can invert the channel if we want need to focus on the background. Let's quickly do something. Let's say I want to darken the background. I just use the brightness and contrast, attach the original image, attach this as a mask and just bring the gain down and bring this into the right viewer. And you see that I'm darkening the image in the background, right? So for not too drastic effects, this works quite well. You might see some minor halo like around uh, the people here if the mask isn't 100% accurate or the depth isn't 100% accurate. Um, but for a rough effect like this, it's working. I can't do this, by the way, not with the preview because then it's not sending back an alpha channel. Uh, it's only sending the uh, mask in the in the color channels, in the RGB values. So I'll just turn this off uh, to have it in the alpha channel and I can use it for masking, invert it. Then I have here these map levels, um, which is basically, it says here far limit and near limit. So the default goes from zero to one uh, and you can reduce it and then your mask will already be, uh, well, you can see it on the um, alpha channel, what is happening. Uh, so you're, you're uh, clipping the image, basically clipping the grayscale image. Um, gamma correction, uh, as you imagine, all of this happening on the grayscale image. And then isolation is there to select a specific target depth. And then around that target depth, uh, you can select a tolerance. So we can try, let me disable invert for a second. We can try to select these people here. And let me reduce the tolerance. Yeah, so also that's a bit uh, tricky to, to select them exactly uh, up to a certain uh, level. And then you have a softness range here. Um, you could uh, try to, to get a selection this way and maybe use this for a mask. So in this case, I'm kind of darkening them, but I'm of course selecting everything on the same depth. So I'm also selecting uh, the ground in that area. I mentioned all of these are basically manipulations on a grayscale image. That means you can do these things also externally. And that's important because this thing is slow. You can set it up here to fast. It will be well, faster, but also less accurate. So I prefer accuracy and weight instead. If I play this back, I get like um, roughly 1.2, 1.5 frames per second, um, but I do have an RTX 3090 GPU. So this is a computationally expensive AI tool. Uh, the solution for this is you can uh, cache the depth map and I would recommend cache the whole sequence and then manipulate it as much as you like. That may be a bit um, less convenient than having the sliders all here, uh, but it also means um, that you don't have to recompute it. So what I will do, I will stop this, I will uh, disable this, disable this. So do none of that here. And I will do right click cache to disk, give it a name and just pre-render this. And now this tool will be cached once throughout the sequence. And afterwards I can use it fluently for the whole timeline. So now the whole sequence was rendered and I should have it both in RAM cache, but I also put it on disk cache. So if I close Resolve and uh, come back tomorrow, or if my RAM isn't large enough, then I have it on disk and I can uh, always return back and play this back uh, relatively quickly. So now you can also see the whole sequence. Uh, you see this tool, it's not perfect. There can be some flickering, some jittering around the edges um, and so on. So there are definitely uh, compromises in this type of, of depth estimation. Uh, nonetheless, let's see what we can do. First of all, let me show you how you can do um, basically all these type of things, uh, calculations afterwards without having to re-render um, the depth map. So the simplest way is probably to add a mat control afterwards. So you can add a mat control node, which is uh, intended to manipulate alpha channels. So let me show you the alpha channel left and right. So this is the original one. 
um, which I have cached. And this is the other one. Uh, by the way, if you want to be sure that you don't accidentally manipulate it, just block the tool so we are not accidentally doing something that causes recalculation. And now we have the threshold, which is equivalent to these um, far near and far um, levels that you can set in the tool. That's the threshold. Gamma is the same as the gamma in the other tool. And then you see here uh, there is these post-processing options with contract and expand and blur. Um, and that's pretty much uh, stuff like, like this, this is like mask manipulation, expanding a mask on the edges and so on. Um, you can do here, you can blur a mask to make it softer. Uh, the only thing that you can't do very easily is to select um, like an individual depth level. Uh, it is possible. There are different um, slightly tricky solutions for it. I just show you one in case you need it and you can just take over the solution the way um, I'm proposing it. And I will do this with a custom tool. Again, uh, today, two custom tools in one tutorial. Wow. I, never using them that much. Anyhow, I'm using the custom tool and I want to use one number here for the depth. By the way, in the config section, you can rename them if you want to. You can call this depth. And well, that's the name. And now I go into the channels section where I want to manipulate the alpha channel. And I will do the following. I will take the depth here. Let's set this. This is around alpha 0.3 or something like this. Uh, let me set this to yeah, that depth. It was almost there. Uh, so I've set the number, the depth slider here, which is number in one. I've set this to roughly the depth of the person here. And I will do the following. I will, in the channels, I will first manipulate the alpha channel so that it's bringing the depth to zero for the uh, level here. So I subtract the slider here and the slider is the first number in input from the control section. So I can subtract n1. Um, once I do this and bring it into the view, I bring it into the view on the right side. Now this one is zero. Uh, here we have negative values for everything that's uh, beyond and everything before has low values, this being zero. Um, now I will take the absolute value from this, which means I will no longer have negative values, but I have this zero. And then uh, as further, far as I go away from this in a linear fashion, uh, the values are increasing and they're also increasing in this direction. And now I will subtract one minus um, to make sure that this is white. The object that I'm selecting is white. And then it's going darker both to the back and to the front. It's also going darker. If you don't see this, I can always um, do, for example, the mat control again. Um, put the mat control afterwards, bring the mat control and work again with these threshold values. So we can uh, bring the threshold in and can use this to select exactly to the depth that I selected via this depth slider. So I have in the custom tool a depth slider here. Um, if you can, by the way, if you can think of a simpler way of doing this, let me know in the comments. But this custom tool is the simplest way I could think of to take it out of this uh, tool and make it flexible. And now we can also have multiple such solutions to sample different depth at the same time without manipulating the depth map itself. Okay, so um, this is uh, the idea threshold. And then if you want, you could blur it again to give softness, or you can use the, the gamma to expand this a bit, make it, you know, the from the around the threshold to make the edges softer or, or harder. So far, I used the depth only as a mask or as an alpha channel. Uh, you can, in Fusion, use it as a Z channel. You can attach it as an additional channel, which goes along with the image. So you can have, in addition to regular transparency, you can have the depth as a different channel information. And there are certain tools which can use that. If you want to set this up, I would add a channel Boolean here. And let me just connect this here after the depth map. If I bring this into the viewer, uh, so right now it's not doing anything. It's just copying the channels that are coming. Um, the alpha channel was set by the depth map. Uh, I don't want this. So I will set this to white, which just means fully opaque. So no transparency. Um, that's 
what I do here and then in the auxiliary channels I enable extra channels and can enable here the alpha channel as the Z channel. So I'm bringing the alpha channel into the Z buffer. And what you see here is that you have now an additional channel and when I bring this in I don't see anything right away but you see the uh, values at the bottom if you look the, at the Z values. Um, what you should do when you're looking at technical channels usually you have to normalize the viewer. You can click here normalize color range um, which remaps the values from the technical channel into the 0, 1 range where it's visible for us. Um, yeah, so that's just something uh, for technical values to do. So now we have a Z channel um, where the front is well, 0.56 something and then getting darker uh, and then uh, so as per the range that we selected uh, but keep in mind it can vary like from one frame to uh, the other uh, right the the distribution can can vary a little bit uh, now in fusion usually the z channel is uh, going in the negative direction so usually it starts with negative values from the camera going backwards and then the further you're away the more negative you are. That's the convention how it's usually in Fusion. You don't have to follow it. There's a lot you could do even uh, the way it's here with positive values. Um, but well yeah negative is uh, customary. So here the Z channel goes from larger values in the front to smaller values in the back. Uh, let me use the mat control before I go into the Z channel. So in the mat control I can invert the mat um, which basically is the first step. Uh, so it goes now from zero to uh, larger values in the back and then smaller uh, values in the front. And then I can also set this to subtract and then you see uh, if I'm subtracting and there was no Z channel before I'm subtracting from nothing so the values become automatically negative. Um, other ways to set this up but we have now here minus 0.5 and here we have minus 1 at the end um, so we have uh, the range increasing backwards and going negative. Uh, let's go back to the color channels and you see I'm seeing nothing uh, because I'm subtracting everything including the color channel so I don't want to do anything here so I set all of this to do nothing and well that now didn't work so I will you know I will do nothing here and uh, set the alpha channel separately so I'll just add another channel boolean to kill the alpha channel afterwards set the alpha channel to uh, white afterwards and then this combination would be a setup for the Z channel in the typical fashion going negative starting with small values going into larger values in the back. That's the typical setup. Um, what can we do with the Z channel? For example we can use a, a simple fog effect in Fusion. Um, let's bring this into the viewer, sample the depth or we know that the near plane should be 1 and the far plane should be minus 1 uh, because that's the range that we have been creating um, and now we get a fork which goes uh, all the way to the end and if we bring the far plane here down to uh, less then we are making like really opaque fork that kind of blocks the view and doesn't go to reach the end of the depth. Okay so this is um, one thing we can do. Uh, likewise there is a depth blur effect which works pretty much the same way. Uh, so you can use this. It can blur based on the Z channel. The further back you are the more blur you get. You can also pipe in other channels here so you can use it in other ways as well but it can use the Z channel. Um, you can also use the Z channel inside merges for compositing. Uh, let me bring in a merge node. Let's put uh, just a, a, a text for example. Now the text doesn't have a depth um, but the background does and in the merge you can go into channels, enable depth merge and then choose a Z offset and sample where this text should go. Um, for example we could sample a depth here and now you see that the depth is, the text is being merged um, behind those people because I sampled depth further away uh, than here my astronauts in the beginning. Um, again compositing how accurate is this? Well 
not super accurate and once you play back you will probably see a few problems depending on how accurate the AI identified the depth. But for some effects, maybe like some loose smoke or so, something that doesn't have to be 100% accurate or lots of uh, blurry stuff before, etc., um, then it might actually work. Now there is certainly more that you can do with Z-Depth. It's also possible to combine Z-Depth with other information like a tracked camera. Uh, use a camera and the Z-Depth combined, then you can compute positional information in principle um, and that would again give you uh, different things like volumetric effects and stuff like that. Um, I haven't tried all of this yet and we'll have to see how, how much we can get out of the accuracy from, from this tool. Uh, but there's certainly a lot to explore and in case I find out something interesting I'll make another tutorial and if you find something interesting uh, let us know but this should give you a good idea to uh, get started with depth map manipulations. I hope you enjoyed this overview of the Fusion 18 editions. This was certainly a bit more advanced. As always, you find systematic training courses on my website. And if you have anything to add here, let us know. And thanks for watching. See you next time. Cheers.